reading from the book of Revelation to John. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. And he also said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. Lord, grant us weak eyes for things of little worth and eyes clear sighted in all of your truth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. For the month of November, we will be focusing on our parish value of inclusivity. And so, as we've been doing at the beginning of each month, I invite us to take up your bulletins and turn to the second page where you will find our mission and values listed. And I'm going to invite you to respond to the question about mission and vision and then to give the response under inclusivity. What is the mission of Holy Comforter? What is the vision of Holy Comforter? Empowered by the Holy Spirit to share God's love, compassion. And how do we value inclusivity? We strive to be welcoming faith community that values all people and the diverse gifts they bring. Thank you. Inclusivity. It is a word and a concept and a practice which carries a great deal of weight and significance. For some, it is something of a code word that represents a whole host of other social arrangements. For others, it is at the very heart, the center of what it means to follow Jesus. Wherever we find ourselves on that spectrum of inclusivity and its significance to us, I think we can at least agree that in, in a simple sense, in a very practical sense, we all want to be included. And whatever extension, whatever we do to serve inclusivity in our community and perhaps any other communities, families that we're part of, part of that has to do also with our own sense of wanting to be included. We include others, we desire the inclusion of others because we ourselves desire to be included. 
desire to belong, to be welcomed, to receive hospitality, even as we practice hospitality with others. And if we think about what the opposite of inclusivity is, a whole other host of terms and practices come to mind. Separation, segregation, isolation, alienation. And these terms, I want to suggest, this opposite of inclusivity actually has an enormous importance to why it is that we give inclusivity prevalence in the first place. What it means to isolate and what it means to be alienated has to be, in some sense, at the heart of why we strive to include, why we strive to welcome, why we strive to be hospitable. And I want to dwell just a few moments on that whole idea of isolation and alienation, because I, I do think it is at the very heart, not just of our practices of inclusivity, but so much of our world and our time, indeed, so much of what our community is called to be. And I want to look at isolation and alienation just very briefly through the lens of our reading from St. John's Gospel, the rising of Lazarus. Jesus doesn't get a lot of emotions projected onto him, or he doesn't show a great deal of emotion throughout the Gospels, but here we have that classic short verse in Scripture where we hear of Jesus weeping. And of course he wept. Lazarus was his friend. And I want to suggest that this is an important piece to just keep in mind that Jesus wept at the death of his friend. And why is it important? Well, if nothing else, it's because that's what we do as humans. We weep and mourn the death of our friends. Today is Sunday after All Saints. It is a commemoration, among other things, of those who we love but see no longer, as the prayer book says. Those who have passed on into glory. Those who now dwell in the fullness and presence of God in light, where there is no tears, no sorrow. But death itself, well, death itself is perhaps the most alienating experience and force there is. And Jesus knows that. And he experiences it with his friend. As we ourselves, of course, experience it. The alienation of death is both an inevitability, we all know that it is impossible to get out of life alive. And yet, the isolation and alienation that death brings upon us always comes as a surprise, an unwelcomed stranger, an unwelcomed guest in our midst. And Jesus, as we hear it in John's Gospel, expresses that kind of grief. But of course, the story doesn't end there, because the ministry in person of Jesus is not fundamentally about the power of alienation or isolation. Jesus's orientation to the one he calls Father is not fundamentally about the inevitability of death. It is about something else. It is about resurrection. It is about life in the fullness and presence of God. It is what Jesus is referring to as he speaks to Martha when she wonders aloud why it is that Jesus would want to raise her brother, now four days dead, from 
the grave and Jesus says to her, don't you want to see the glory of God? Didn't I tell you you would see the glory of God? Which I interpret to mean, don't you want to see resurrection? Don't you want to see where life leads? Not to the tomb, ultimately, but to life with God and in God and through God and with those with whom God welcomes into God's presence. And that, I want to suggest, is really at the heart of why we want to practice inclusivity. It is because we want to be and desire to be and indeed confess ourselves to be a community that is not oriented fundamentally to the inevitability of death and its alienating and isolating powers. Whether that's death in the physical ordinary sense or whether it's the many small deaths which take place in our lives and those around us and those particularly on the margins of society, those small deaths which take place with every level of alienation and isolation in which is opposed upon them, imposed perhaps upon us. No, we may recognize death, but it is not our destiny. Our destiny is resurrection. And we welcome those in our midst. We invite those to join us to be part of our community. We practice hospitality, not just for its own sake. Important as that is, we all want to be part of a welcoming church, a welcoming faith community. And we strive for it as we say in our values. But the reason, the real why behind inclusivity is not welcome for welcome's sake. It is not so that we can feel good about ourselves, about how inclusive we are. It is certainly not a church growth strategy. It is about something more profound or it really is about nothing. And that profound thing is to live fully into being Easter people, resurrection people, people oriented to the new life which is promised and given to us by God through the raised body of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, we are Easter people. We know death. We will experience it. We will mourn and we will weep as we ought, but we are not oriented to it. We do not have fate. We have a destiny. And that destiny is being welcomed into the presence of God. It is to see the glory of God in all God's abundance and joy. It is to be taken up into the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It is to put an end to the isolation and the alienation that is death and all the small deaths. And it is to be welcomed and taken up into something far more glorious, far more significant. We practice inclusivity, we put it in our parish values, we look to it as something that we do in small and large ways, because as we do it, we are orienting ourselves to resurrection. We are overcoming the alienation and isolation which enfolds so many in our world, those daily deaths that many in our community face, and we are bringing others with us as we orient towards our destiny with God. It is because we are an Easter people, it is because we are a resurrection people that we practice inclusivity, that we strive to welcome, that we welcome the diverse gifts of all members into our body, because that is how we live. 
as people welcomed into the very life of God. We practice welcome, friends, because we were first welcomed into the presence and company of God. And this is more than just a pious sentiment. As resurrection people, we are not oriented to the inevitability of death, but to the promise and hope of sharing in the raised life of Christ. And this is the message not only of all saints and all souls, but it animates how we organize ourselves, how we welcome and are welcomed, how we practice that inclusivity in small and large ways. For to be welcomed into the raised body of Christ, to see the glory of God, as Jesus says, is what it means to be inclusive in the first place. For it is with God and with one another that we discover the true power of community, the true power of belonging, which is not just for its own sake, but always because we are journeying together towards something greater still. to be lifted and raised with Christ into the glorious company of the saints of old and into the very glory of God. And that is a belonging, a community, a way of being inclusive that not even death can break. We value inclusivity because we are an Easter people. Amen. As an Easter people, let us, with one voice, confess with confidence our faith through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, for on being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, she is worshipped and glorified. She has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. 
the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins for our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. offer up this Eucharist to the glory of God, and on this All Saints Sunday, 
we offer up in thanksgiving and remembrance of those who have died. Before we enter into the great thanksgiving, I invite us now, either silently or aloud, to lift before God's presence those for whom we mourn, those for whom we love and see no longer. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, and planets in their courses, and this fragile Earth, our island home. By you were filled, and have there been. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord, for we are sinners in your sight. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood he reconciled us. By his wounds we are healed. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. And so, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal, that the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of bread. Accept these praises, prayers and praises, Father, through Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit 
Your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God, the holy things for the holy ones.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. It is a delight to be gathered with you this day as God's people, whether gathered here physically, in person, in the parish, and those joining us in the digital spaces of Zoom. A special welcome to you all. A special, special welcome to those who are new or visiting with us today. I do hope that you will be able to stick around as you leave uh, the church to grab a coffee in McGlaris Hall and make your way out to the labyrinth for our grab-and-go coffee hour this morning. Thank you for the hospitality committee for hosting this and for making it possible. So look forward to greeting you in the labyrinth uh, following the service. I have here before me pledge cards which represent your generosity, our generosity, our, our shared practice of giving in service to our common life together as a church. And thank you, thank you for your generous giving. And I'd like to offer these cards up in prayer and blessing before God as symbols of our, our entire level of investment in moving together as a community in these still strange days, particularly as we respond and discern where it is that God is calling us. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for what these gifts represent. Let us pray. Gracious God, you are the giver of all good gifts. You are a generous and gracious God. And we thank you for placing in us that, that spark of generosity, that divine spirit which calls us into serving those things beyond ourselves, serving one another through our time and talent and treasure. We ask your blessing to be upon these pledge cards which represent the generosity of this community, a transforming generosity which positions us as we live more deeply into where you are calling us to be and with whom you are calling us to be. May these gifts truly be signs and may they encourage us as we move forward as a church. And we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Today, I'm going to ask Larry Banks to come up to invite us into something which brings together that theme of transforming generosity that we have been exploring and living into, and today's and this month's theme of inclusivity, bringing together generosity and inclusivity into an exciting new venture for us. Larry? Thank you, Father. Good morning. Many of you already know that Holy Comforter <clears throat> is working in partnership with Lutheran Family Services to adopt a family of Afghan refugees that wants to settle in Broomfield. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time holding it together here. <sighs> I learned on Friday that our family will be big, as many as eight or 10 possibly. And there's a reason for that. When you live in a country that is torn with war and threatened with terrorism, 
you actually, death is not a sometime thing, it's a daily reality. Living in that reality, they actually expect that they will lose some family members at some point along the way, and so they compensate for that by having as many children as they can. I'm told that uh, they, our family may be here within the next two to four weeks. Now each family needs a sponsor that will help them with everything from food and meals, rent, clothing, transportation, assistance with finding employment, assistance with schooling for the children, driving lessons. In conjunction with FISH, A Precious Child, and other community nonprofits, and using the lessons that we have learned in resettling a family that is already settled here, we will be their primary source of support for all these things. Yes, it's huge. But we are not alone. You may know that Heidi Hankel, her family and friends are supporting the Siddiqui family. Heidi is just being tremendous about giving us the benefit of all the contacts she has made and all she has learned about what is involved. We will not be inventing the wheel here. Heidi's already done it. So we're going to follow in, in, in her footsteps. She's just done a tremendous job. And some of you know very well our friend Bookie from St. Bridges. Bookie and St. Bridges are partnering with us and going to be part of this uh, effort. I've spoken with Father Bill at St. Albans, and he's speaking to his uh, uh, community engagement team and he very much wants to be part of that and I, I expect that they will participate in some form or another and I just I want to say thank you um, to many of you who are here and the others that I've spoken to the generosity of spirit and the well you know nobody has said no there's been a resounding yes what can I do to help so very grateful so I have two requests of you today. We want this to be a project supported by the entire Holy Comforter family. So we're asking you to consider how you might participate. I understand that you will have questions and want to know more about what specific ways you can contribute. My email is in the e-news and the bulletin. Please send me an email and we'll talk and we'll find a way that will work for you. There's so much to do and, and so many wonderful ways to participate. It's such a privilege to do so. And if all you can do is pray on a regular basis for the family and the success of this resettlement project, that is no small thing. The success of this project ultimately rests with God. We will be his hands and feet and your prayers will give us wings. The second request is that you look out for any rental housing that may be available where the landlord would, would be willing to work with us on establishing a reasonable rent. There is a scarcity of affordable housing in Broomfield, so we need everyone to be on the lookout for us. If you come across something, please let me know. We are doing a good thing, Holy Comforter. We are loving our neighbors and opening our hearts to those who are in great need. I look forward to speaking more with you. Thank you and God bless you. A lot before us, a lot of opportunities and possibilities and invitations and I'm, I'm excited to see what unfolds. Friends, just two quick other announcements. Uh, the first is that this coming Thursday, November 11th, we continue our senior seminars with a seminar on the questions around probate. Do I need it? Do I need to avoid it? How long does probate last? Lots and lots of questions, lots of important questions. We'll have attorney Skip Reynolds here to answer those questions, you can contact Ann Shaw for more information. It is this Thursday, November 11th, from 9.30 to 10.30 in McGlarris Hall. And finally, a special word of thanks to all those who made possible and participated in Friday's All Souls concert, to Ben and Mary and to all the gifted musicians 
who really showcased their gifts for us and with us at that concert and for the very moving mood and invitation it itself offered as a way to both remember and give thanks to God for those who have passed on into glory and to do so with the profound musical talents and gifts that we have here at Holy Comforter. So thank you. Invite us now to stand and we'll sing our concluding hymn. Let's go forth to McLaris Hall and grab coffee and go out to the labyrinth in the name of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God.